Hello, I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson and welcome to Arts in the City. We're along Museum Mile outside of the wonderful Museum of the City of New York. We'll be heading inside shortly, but first, David Henry Wong is a Tony Award winning playwright who's about to debut a new musical, Kung Fu, based on the life of actor Bruce Lee. Ernabel DeMillo sat down with him recently to talk about his work. The setting of David Henry Wong's play Golden Child, which was recently revived at the Signature Theater, is early 20th century China. It's the story of a traditional Chinese man with a dilemma. This is essentially the story of my great-grandfather and how he converted to Christianity in China during the 20s and then the 1920s, and then the effect that this had on his three wives, because Chinese men were polygamous at the time, so like he became a Christian, but then what do you do with these wives? East meets West, assimilation and cultural clashes. These are the familiar themes for the award-winning playwright. Wong currently holds the distinguished title of playwright in residence at the Signature Theater. He follows in the footsteps of many great playwrights, including Arthur Miller, August Wilson and Edward Albee. Wong, who grew up in California, is the son of Chinese immigrants and is celebrating 30 years in theater. He is not only one of theater's most famous playwrights, but also the most recognizable Asian American to bring the community's narrative to the stage. Although I've written a lot of different kinds of stories in different mediums, uh, when I come back to plays, which are the more most personal form, I still seem to be attracted to um, telling stories about um, Asians or Asian Americans um, uh, and, and those characters. So I guess there's some part of me um, that as an artist, this is still material I need to work out and I still find it fascinating. And I think a lot of artists have kind of, you know, a plot of soil that is uh, your most kind of fertile area where your, you know, your artistic um, plants bloom. For David, those so-called artistic plants have bloomed into some of theater's most talked about plays, which deal openly and honestly through satire and drama with Asian stereotypes, racism, and assimilation into Western culture. It started with his first play, the OB award-winning FOB, about the differences between established Asian Americans and those fresh off the boat. He does it again later in Dance in the Railroad, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist and also revived recently at the Signature. The story is set during the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad and told through the eyes of two Chinese workers and the struggles they faced as they try to stay connected to the country they left. Then in 1988, Wong received both a Tony and Drama Desk Award for Best Play for M. Butterfly, based loosely on the real-life relationship of a French ambassador and a male peaking opera singer. And he is the first playwright to collaborate on the small screen, the very small screen. His award-winning off-Broadway play, Yellowface, has the distinction of being the first play to be adapted to YouTube. In this day and age, a Caucasian playing a Chinese, it's racist, sexist, imperialist, misogynistic. And I didn't even get an audition. To be able to take a play and try to do it on YouTube seemed like something that hasn't been done before, but that's part of the excitement of it. It's like the early days of film, and it was really great to get to be part of that, and I loved the way the film turned out. Wong's next project will bring him back to the stage. Up next at the signature is the much anticipated play Kung Fu, the story of one of the most iconic of all Asian movie stars, Bruce Lee. For Wong, who grew up watching Bruce Lee, it's a story he's been wanting to tell for some time now. You know, I've been wanting to do a Bruce Lee story ever since the mid-90s. And I think it's because I started to feel, oh, this, the image of China has changed so much in my lifetime. Uh, when I was a kid, China was sort of poor and uneducated and dysfunctional. And now it's sort of, you know, if anything, people worried about having too much power and too much money, and it's the next superpower. And all that happened just in the course of the, of the last 30, 40 years. And Bruce Lee comes along at just the moment when the image of China starts to change. And he becomes the sort of first pop culture manifestation of that. So I wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore sort of what it means to be an Asian American man and the masculinity issues and the challenges um, that exist, which I think he had to face both as a person and also dealing with the media in Hollywood. 
Again, Wong will deal with similar issues of assimilation and belonging, but this time the protagonist is one of the world's most popular icons, which could mean a new audience to Wong's works. Kung Fu, which originally was conceived as a musical, will now be a play with music, dance, and of course, martial arts. I hope that what the play is able to do is of course he's a martial artist, and of course martial arts is going to be a, good, a big part of the play. But I also hope that the play is able to kind of reveal the human being uh, underneath that. Wong says no matter what the theme or the message, it really all boils down to telling a story that will resonate with the audience. But basically at this point, I feel like, you know, my primary responsibility is to be the best writer I can and do the best work I can, because if I don't do that, nobody's going to care what I have to say about anything anyway. Wong has been commissioned to write the libretto for An American Soldier, an opera based on the life of Private Danny Chen, a Chinese-American soldier who served in Afghanistan and took his own life after being repeatedly bullied by his own fellow soldiers. It's a really astounding group of people, and we all, it was such an easy thing to make. I think we all have very different processes and we are very different actors, but ultimately, coming together, we were able to immediately get on the same page and help each other and challenge each other, and it's a really, really extraordinary group of actors. It's an art form that has its roots in Paris, but somehow seems quintessentially New York. Tina Beth Pina takes us inside the world of cabaret. Cabaret is enjoying a resurgence in New York City after a year that saw one of its iconic clubs close their doors forever. The Algonquin's Oak Room was the musical home for legendary cabaret singer Andrea Markovici. For me, after 25 years of being in residence, it was like losing a home. I felt I, I was devastated. It's not only a personal loss, but it's a cultural loss because a historic room of that beauty to lose is a piece of New York's heart gone. Cabaret had its birth in Paris in 1881 at Le Chanois. In its infancy, a cabaret was a place where intellectuals and poets shared their work with other people in a social setting. By the 20th century, the idea had spread beyond Paris, and cabaret evolved into a style of performance characterized by an intimate nightclub setting featuring a variety of entertainers. There was a time in cabaret in New York when you couldn't swing a cat without hitting some cabaret room. I mean, there was one in the Pierre, there was one in the St. Regis, there was one in the Plaza, there was uh, all up and down 55th Street. They were, they were everywhere. There used to be circuits where every hotel had a cabaret and somebody would be able to tour. And in the late 50s, early 60s, there were um, more review-style cabarets where four people would be on a show in every night. And then it became satirical with skits and comedy mixed in with the singing. And we had so many, Bonsoir and uh, the Rubin Bleu and Upstairs at the Downstairs. But its popularity declined for a number of reasons. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, Live from the Las Vegas Desert Inn and Stardust, The Ed Sullivan Show. Television actually hurt cabaret in the early 60s. At a time that most of the cabaret artists were seen in cabarets and you would go out all night long to go from club to club to club, suddenly they're on The Ed Sullivan Show. And so many of these performers are now on TV. And TV itself made people stay home. It was a new phenomenon. Let's stay home and watch television. Very different. It's kind of what I feel about let's stay home and see what my Facebook is giving me today. Cafe Carlisle is the last of the remaining original cabaret clubs in New York City. But there is a resurgence of sorts with new venues like 54 Below. 54 Below has become a hub. You know, unlike the other rooms, we're not limited to any one audience. We have a young audience, we have an old audience, so we're able to get a lot of different and diverse people through the doors. I think it's, it 
provides um, an ability for artists and audience to interact in a really intimate and personal way that, uh, that is essential to, you know, to the progression of the art form. It never dies. It, every time they say it's dying, it's not dying because <laughs> it never does. I've been here for 27 years. That's my career for 27 years. Michael Feinstein, longer. Barbara Cook, longer. I mean, there's so many of us that have thrived in this industry. It's, it's a question, it just, it just moves. After so many years of success, why do you keep doing it? The real reason I keep doing it is because of the way people come up to me after the shows. I'm part of their life, and they've been seeing me for 25 years. And that's not somebody on a record. That's not somebody that they paid their money to see. That is something far beyond it. It's something magical. For Arts in the City, I'm Tina Beth Pina. For Tennessee's 100th birthday, they published a new um, edition of The Glass Menagerie, and the foreword was written by Tony Kushner. And that was the first thing that I went out and bought when I knew I was going to do the play. And now here we are on our first day of rehearsal for the Broadway production, and we're at the Signature Center, which is the space that opened right after we finished our production of Angels in America a couple of years ago. So for me, there's a lot of little uh, indicators that I'm on the right path and that this is uh, an experience that I've been dreaming of my whole life to be on Broadway, so uh, I, I couldn't be more excited. I'm so grateful and just so blessed to be here with these incredible people and uh, have this experience. They're neuroscientists by day and rockers by night, writing about life, love, and, well, science. They're called the amygdaloids, and Barry Mitchell sat down with them recently. Joseph Ledoux. I'm a professor of neuroscience at NYU. Um, I run something called the Ledoux Laboratory. In the Ledoux Lab, we study emotion, memory, and the brain. Dr. Ledoux is also author of the best-selling book, The Emotional Brain, still in print after 15 years. But today, we're here to talk to Joe Ledoux, rock and roll star. I'm also the lead singer and guitar player in The Amygdaloids. Named after the almond-shaped part of the brain he studies at Ledoux Labs. The amygdala is a key structure. It detects danger and produces hardwired protective responses. The amygdala also forms emotional memories. It uses these to predict harm in the future. Today we're listening in as Joe and members of the amygdaloids, Amanda Thorpe on bass and Daniela Schiller on drums, rehearse songs for their upcoming EP, Map of Your Mind. Their music has been described as heavy mental because like their previous albums, all the music is based on themes about mind and brain and mental disorders. The way I describe my songs is songs about life and love with uh, nuggets of information about mind and brain thrown in. The video fearing was directed by Noah Hutton. Uh, we did it in a barn upstate. While I was fearing in came. The lyrics come from a poem by Emily Dickinson, which I used, uh, modified a bit to make it work more as a song. Vivid rehearsal of pain, and uh, she apparently had, you know, some problems, and so she um, gives us a kind of clinical case study of her fears and anxieties. It's not about actually encountering the dangerous thing; it's just waiting for it. It keeps fear in my brain. I just started actually my own lab in Mount Sinai, and I'm interested in learning uh, how. Um, fear is represented in the brain, how we overcome fear uh, in humans. And by uh, understanding fear, we hope to understand other emotions. And you've pushed the envelope of fear because you're a skydiver. Does it ever get easier when you're free-falling? Never. It actually gets worse. The easiest 
jump is the first one. Because Why? Uh, well, afterward, you really know what you're going into, and it, it just gets scarier and scarier. Um, it's a song, Mind Over Matter, that we have the good fortune to have Brooke Cash sing with me on. Mind over matter There's something I'm trying to do I guess it's only physics That keeps me apart from you You know, it's more of a ballad and a song about uh, wanting to connect with someone who's no longer with you for whatever reason um, and pull that person back into your mind, not obviously into your physical presence, but into your mind. So class, what have we learned today? Fear, rage, and love. It's not every day you meet a neuroscientist who clinically studies emotions and writes songs about them. So I had to ask... We can identify them, but we right. can't control them. Why? Well, we're at a point right now where the emotional brain and the cognitive brain are not quite in sync. The cortex is necessary to control your emotions. So the amygdala, once aroused, is very difficult to turn off by the cortex. We don't want to be Mr. Spock, where you know, we have total control over every emotional nuance. We don't want that. Why don't we want to be Mr. Spock? Because our emotions uh, make our life worth living. And if we're totally in control, we have no surprise, no uh, uh, nothing to look forward to. <laughs> it's just all predictable. And we have no music? No music, definitely no music. Dance is a living art, and that makes it hard to preserve. However, a new language is now emerging in order to keep that choreography alive as the artist intended. Lisa Beth Kovitz has that story. When you want to preserve or share a musical composition, you write it down. Poem, play, novel, all written down. But how does a choreographer share or save a dance. I spoke to Christopher Pennington, executive director of the Jerome Robbins Foundation, about their work preserving the Robbins legacy. Jerry was very specific about how his ballets looked, about the ambiance, the atmosphere, and so we very much maintained them the way he had them. You want to avoid change without making something into a museum piece. You don't want to rob the life from it. So you want it to be alive, you want it to be somewhat malleable, but you don't want it to go in a direction that the choreographer did not intend. And I think that's specifically the challenge of the ballet master. The ballet master is someone who transposes ballets from either the page or from a videotape onto dancers' bodies. The term is a, is a very ancient one, going back to the Paris Opera. What you're responsible for is really knowing the material of the ballet inside out. Sometimes it's a ballet that you dance personally, which is always an advantage. But the act of mastering all the dancer's parts is a very involved one. So how does a ballet master remember every nuance of every part of a ballet? Videotape is extremely important, but somebody's got to take notes. For West Side Story, that was somebody sitting down and literally writing out in English as descriptive a, a description as they possibly could. And it's, it's a very odd thing to read. I feel like when I read it, it doesn't make much sense unless you're actually watching it. And then you go, oh, well, that's, of course that's what that is. You know, hold your arms out, snap your fingers, blah, 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 blah. It must have been quite a challenge for, I believe it was Tommy Abbott who wrote it all down. It's a little crazy. Choreographers and ballet masters have always had their own personal systems of notation. But over the years, notation has been codified so larger groups can understand a choreographer's intention. It's a system called lob notation which started in the 1920s with Rudolf Laban. Later in the 50s, 60s, an international body was created to make rules for all of international use of the system. To create a language? Yes, it is a language. It is a living, growing language. In the same way that various computer languages are artificial languages, they didn't come from a person pointing to something and making a grunt or a sound. 
most dances are done to music, so let's have it follow along a staff in the same way a music score follows. You read it from bottom to top. So a person's body is divided into right and left halves. You'll find the symbols for the right side of the body on the right side of the score, left side of the body, left side of the score, and the steps are read up the way that you might read Dance Dance Revolution. Well, in a tour jeté, you're going to step on the left foot, your right foot goes up to forward middle, you have a turn in the air, and then you land on the right foot with the left foot behind. When you read it as if it is a word, and Le Bon notation is not the only one. These new languages are a great boon for dance, especially when combined with good old-fashioned human interaction. Fafan was a very, one of the first roles I danced at the New York City Ballet. So I danced it for many years, and I had the privilege to have Jerry coach me one-on-one -on -one in, in the ballet um, for many, many rehearsals. So it's going to be a thrill to be able to be in front of a group of students and to try to impart those details and, and that specific information to them. I'm bringing Heather Watts in to help me because while I will know the female role inside and out, there's nothing like someone who has danced the role personally to give their insights because to tell the story in that particular piece, um, you have to really be accurate. Otherwise, you lose the storyline, you lose um, the nuance of the work. This has been Lisa Beth Kovas for Arts in the City. There are amazing gifts available at museum shops, like the one right here at the Museum of the City of New York. So get ready for that holiday shopping spree. The Guggenheim store specializes in artist editions and architecturally inspired products that you can only get here. Many of our top sellers are inspired by the Frank Lloyd Wright building uh, completed in 1959. We have the rotunda as a coffee mug, we have it as a light, we have models in paper cutouts or in Lego form. This holiday season might be one of your last chances to get one. To wear, we have jewelry available in sterling silver and fine materials, something that really is a statement piece that will last you a lifetime. One of our exciting new products is the paper wallet. It's a Tyvek wallet with art from street artists and graffiti artists around New York City and the world. So you're able to purchase a work of art and carry it with you everywhere. The Guggenheim store partners with Carol Cassidy, a well-known textile designer who works out of Laos and Cambodia. And her scarves are beautiful. In Cambodia, her workshop is outfitted with looms so that victims of landmine disasters can still lead productive lives. So she's saved motifs that would have been lost to history forever and she's given new life to villages and women in Laos and Cambodia. Next on our tour, the Museum Store at the New York Historical Society. We are American history wrapped up in New York, and we are New York giving you back the experience of American history that you can interpret in myriad ways. When you come into the Museum Store right now, you'll find that we have addressing the current exhibition, The Armory Show at 100, which is a centennial exhibition for an epic art exhibition. It's really about how the world has changed in 100 years and how we see what people thought was new and novel and shocking in 1913 and how we see that today. Now, to interpret that in the store, we find and seek other materials that will live for people. This dress, for instance, which is using images from Vasily Kandinsky, he's represented in the exhibition, it's actually a chance for people to take that spirit, that feeling, and bring it home to them. Our exhibition on women's suffrage is a great opportunity to find holiday gifts for any age and for the home. Those women of 1913 who were protesting can now educate women in the 21st century about who they are and where they're going to go. 
the museum collection includes a vast number of historic board games from the turn of the 20th century. And in that regard, we have had a, a puzzle created. When you assemble the jigsaw puzzle, it becomes the board game for a game that was extremely popular 100 years ago, and it's called Round the World with Nellie Bly. Another place for unique gift-giving ideas are the shops of the Jewish Museum. And it's not just for people who celebrate Hanukkah. So while we have the name Jewish in our store, we are really a destination for everybody. We have products for people of all backgrounds, and for holidays you can find so many wonderful things that are based on Jewish art and culture but really have universal appeal. There are products designed by contemporary artists that reflect the exhibitions of the museum. One of my favorites is the Jewish mother gum. The packaging and the text on this gum are all by artist Myra Kalman, whose work is part of the museum's permanent collection. It's colorful on the outside, it's super funny. When you open it up, inside are not only chiclet gum, but also conversation that Myra imagined a Jewish mother might say about chewing gum. Another product we have is a skateboard by Kehinde Wiley. This artwork that's on the skateboard is included in the museum's permanent collection. It's part of his series called World Stage Israel. We are the destination for Hanukkah shopping. We have menorahs for everybody. This year's great because the second night of Hanukkah is on Thanksgiving, so we have a few things to celebrate the holidays in seasonal style, one of which is our Hanukkah on Thanksgiving set of harvest-colored Hanukkah candles. So you can light your menorah on the first two nights of Hanukkah in great coordinated Thanksgiving color. We also have the Minerki, which was designed by Asher Weintraub in New York. He is nine years old, and he funded it on a Kickstarter campaign. We're the exclusive New York City retailer of the Minerki, and the candles are exclusive. We, we design those ourselves. These gifts are for all ages and price ranges. And remember, your purchases continue to support all these incredible museums. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, you can log on to cuny.tv. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. We'll see you next time on Arts in the City.